Well, hello, LBJ fans. I'm Michael Hole coming at you from Austin, Texas, and we are in for a real treat today. I am here with the one and only Dr. Zeke Emanuel. So welcome in, Zeke. Nice to see you again. Great to be here. I've got a few questions for you, and as a fellow physician, I am just excited to have an opportunity to pick your brain. And so I'm going to dive right in. Um, I want to start on kind of a somber note, uh, something that's on my heart, certainly, and on the hearts of Americans across the country, which is that we are enduring several national crises at once. Over 200,000 people have died from the COVID-19 pandemic. We have an economic recession impacting small businesses on main streets across the country. And of course, recurring racial strife that is causing, to say the least, heartache and certainly disparities in outcomes. Uh, but we know that President Johnson never shied away from national crises. In fact, he leaned into those times. Um, capitalized on the public's concern and attention to push his agenda and accelerate positive change. And so I want to start off by asking, what kinds of change do you see today's leaders accelerating, for better or worse? Um, and perhaps most importantly, what opportunities are left on the table for our listeners, for folks at the LBJ School, students and others to pick up the torch and carry forward? Well, the last one's easy. There's always going to be big problems uh, that people dedicated to public service can address, um, whether they're climate change uh, or income inequality. Uh, those are things that uh, I'm sure that if LBJ were president, he would have a whirlwind of legislation to address. Uh, I have to say right from the start of the COVID pandemic uh, in January and February, I often thought, you know, what would LBJ do if you had a president who really knew how to use the reins of governmental power to address the crisis of the pandemic? And uh, I think it, it's pretty clear he would have appointed a task force um, for every single issue that needs PPE. We have a shortage. Let's get the people, figure out the supply chain, figure out who needs it. Let's use our powers. If we need the Defense Production Act, we'll use that. Testing, same thing, you know, vaccines, therapeutics, just go down the list and he would have empowered people uh, uh, in the government to use all the powers they have to solve the problems. And he would have, you know, figured out how to manage and also get through Congress the legislation needed to generate both the funds, but the authorities to do this properly. Uh, that's the kind of person he was. You have a problem you bring to bear all the resources uh, of the government to solve that problem. And so I think it, it, you know, it, it, it's quite clear how in this moment of crisis, he would have addressed at least that COVID-19 problem. Well, I wanna stay on that health moment for uh, just a bit. I'm a pediatrician for families experiencing homelessness. I'm a civic entrepreneur trying to build new bold solutions to old problems. And so I get to see President Johnson's impact on the health of hardworking Americans regularly, from health insurance to anti-poverty and other types of social programs. His legacy runs deep and wide. And so I'm curious if you might, uh, as a physician and a health policy expert, tell us about LBJ's legacy, the good and the bad, as it relates to Americans' health. It's re really remarkable. So I teach a course called The Future of the American Healthcare System. Uh, and uh, my favorite lecture in that course is the history of reform. And of course, uh, the biggest moment uh, is the, uh, the Medicare and Medicaid, uh, 1965. And really the story begins in 1957 when the first bill for Medicare to provide coverage to the elderly gets introduced in Congress and goes nowhere. Um, and then there's a famous Kennedy-Nixon debate over healthcare, Kennedy favoring the governmental approach, Nixon favoring something which looks an awful lot like uh, the exchanges in the Affordable Care Act give every American uh, uh, payment so that they can buy private health insurance. He had the caveat that it should be not-for-profit private health insurance. Um, and then it doesn't go anywhere. Um, uh, we have a few experiments in the early 60s 
Um, and then President Kennedy gets shot. And one of the things that uh, Lyndon Johnson continues to argue is we've got to complete President Kennedy's legacy. And part of that legacy is getting coverage for the elderly and the poor. Um, and after Lyndon Johnson wins this landslide victory, the sort of congressman who'd been wavering on this, Wilbur Mills, reads the electoral tea leaves and says, starts writing literally Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and you can see how coalitions are made just by that bill and how genius it is, right? So Medicare Part A, which covers hospitals, that's a democratic proposal. The government's going to have a, uh, um, a, a payroll tax, going to provide for every elderly person uh, um, ho hospital coverage. Then there's the physician part of it. And that looks like the Republican proposal. So people buy insurance uh, um, uh, they contribute 25% of it, 75% from the government, and they get uh, physician coverage. Um, and then you have Medicaid, which looks like Wilbur Mills's bill that had been called elder care, give money to the state's revenue share between the federal and state governments. Um, now, the legacy is pretty clear. Medicare uh, really, I mean, it, the legacy is, you know, there's clearly one in healthcare, um, in terms of improving the health of the elderly. Uh, but there's also a major impact of Medicare on the poverty rate of the elderly. Uh, the poverty rate of the elderly before 1960 was something over 40%, I believe. And uh, a large part of that, they were getting social security, so retirement was taken care of, but healthcare bills were beginning to grow. Doctors were able to do things and suddenly hospitals were expensive, doctors were expensive. And so the, the elderly who have you know, typically multiple chronic illnesses really began to feel the pinch of healthcare costs and Medicare just transformed that. Now we have you know, poverty among the elderly is around 10%, just a humongous drop, which is directly attributable to Medicare. Um, Medicaid was less successful. And let's just be honest about it. The first demonstration of that is because it was a federal state partnership, states had to enact it and had to pay, you know, less than half the bill, but they still had to pay the bill. We didn't get all the states on until 1982, 17 years after the bill passed. It's also varies from state to state. Yes, there are federal minimums, but, you know, whether a working adult who is poor under the poverty line gets coverage varies from state, varied from state to state before the Affordable Care Act, still varies because 12 states haven't expanded coverage consistent with the Affordable Care Act. It just never worked as well. Um, and part of that was the categorical system, the deserving poor as opposed to all the poor. Um, and I think, you know, in, in that sense, the legacy uh, uh, Medicaid, you know, it helped, certainly it helped a lot, but it, it didn't help as much as it could have, especially I think if it were a federal program uh, uh, through and through. Well, that reminds me too that, uh, you know, you're one of the most sought after public health experts in the country, perhaps one of the chief architects of the Affordable Care Act under the Obama administration. Um, I know you also recently wrote a book about health systems around the world. I'm curious, and uh, through that light of that lens that you were just talking, could you talk a little bit about what you learned in that book? And perhaps since then, I know the pandemic has struck anything changed? Well, one of the things you learn is that we've created the most complex healthcare system in the world. Um, by the way we've enacted things, you know, we're, we're, we have the base of employer-sponsored insurance and we enacted Medicare and Medicaid on top. And then when we couldn't expand to universal coverage under Clinton, we added CHIP. We have a veterans part. We have TRICARE for the military. Uh, then under the Affordable Care Act, we added the exchanges. Um, that complexity is unmatched in the world. And uh, I often joke, when you look around the world, we have a little bit of every healthcare system. You know, you want the British National Health Service, where the government really owns the hospitals and doctors. We got it in the VA. You, you know, you want uh, a system where it's single payer. Um, you know, we've got Medicare. You want a system that uh, people ha have subsidies to purchase among uh, insurers. That's like Netherlands and Germany. We've got all, all of that. That's our exchanges. Um, but that complexity comes at huge costs uh, in terms of administration. Um, it confuses people. It's hard to navigate coverage. So I think one of the 
dictums that we need going forward is simplification. Um, so if I've learned anything from looking overseas, simplification. And by the way, also looking overseas, you can have universal coverage while retaining multiple private insurers that we have in the United States. No contradiction in that. Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland all have that kind of system. Well, we certainly got a lot of decisions on the horizon about that system. Um, and not a secret that you're a world-class bioethicist. I didn't know that you're the most cited in history, which is <laughs> quite impressive. And I'm wondering if you can answer this next question through that lens. I'm curious how ethics could guide our nation's decisions on the horizon. For example, when a vaccine becomes available, what segments of our population should get it first? Uh, and perhaps a bit more broadly, how might ethics guide us as we redesign our health and social systems to prevent some of these disparities in health that the pandemic has so sadly highlighted for us? Wow, those are complicated questions. But let's just speak for, we know that when we get a vaccine in the midst of this coronavirus, we're going to have to allocate it. We're not going to have uh, enough doses for 330 million Americans out of the box, or even 220 million Americans, a number needed for herd immunity out of the box. So we're going to have to uh, progressively distribute it. That's an issue of distributive justice. Um, and one of the things I think that has distinguished the COVID-19 pandemic from other situations is the immediate recognition by everybody that this is an ethical issue and the ethicists have to be at the table right from the start. And that is very different from, I think, almost all of history uh, when it comes to uh, these kind of major uh, decisions about policy. Um, so there have been a, there are a number of uh, initiatives going on to talk about what are the key values. Let, let me just say, I think actually the key values in allocating a scarce resource like uh, um, uh, of COVID vaccine are three. First, you want to limit harm and do the most good you can in the world. And that's the most important goal. Second, you want to mitigate disadvantage. People who are, have been historically disadvantaged, either because they die young or they're exposed to this, uh, more likely to be exposed to this vaccine, contract it, be hospitalized, maybe even die from it. They need priority and they need their disadvantage mitigated. And last, you want to give equal concern to people. So no discrimination on the base of ir basis of irrelevant categories, race or religion. And it seems to me those are deep, deep American values. And those are values that Lyndon Johnson, you know, really tried to embody. Um, and I think, you know, make sure we're embodied in legislation. Um, but I think going forward, they're similarly have to be at the core of uh, any major healthcare reform we do. We have to make sure we take care of disparities. Uh, if COVID has shown anything, it's huge disparities. Um, and Lyndon Johnson was particularly focused on this. Why did he have a war on poverty? Because he wanted to mitigate disadvantage. You know, there's been a lot of rhetoric and, and obfuscation about this. Um, it, it is true, he didn't get rid of poverty. But it's not true that he didn't make a humongous dent in, get, in reducing poverty substantially in this country. Um, and you know, he, he did, as I just mentioned before, the rate of poverty among elderly came down substantially because of his Medicare and Medicaid program. The rate of poverty among children uh, came down. Unfortunately, it's, it's gone up again, uh, which is a, a very unfortunate problem by uh, rolling back some of his uh, programs, um, you know, whether they're uh, food stamps or other programs, absolutely critical uh, to focus on the disadvantaged. Um, we also know that um, we still have a gap between whites with insurance and African Americans and particularly Hispanics. That gap has narrowed because of the Affordable Care Act, but it's not going away. If we really care, and this is a fundamental ethical principle of mitigating disadvantage, we really care about the disadvantage in terms of health coverage and health access, we have to reduce or, or, or we have to get universal coverage. You got to get to 99% coverage, probably through some mechanism of auto enrollment 
which again, Lyndon Johnson knew it was in part A of the Medicare program, the hospital part. And that's a model I think we should be using throughout the system. You know, people shouldn't have to choose. They get automatically enrolled and then we can figure out where, which is the right uh, mechanism. Is it Medicaid or pro uh, employer sponsored insurance uh, or some other mechanism to get them coverage? Um, but I think that's a key place where ethical values have to structure uh, how we sh uh, design the system. Well, thanks for mentioning the piece in particular on children. As a pediatrician, I'm also a new dad. Um, those Congratulations. And those types of thank you. Uh, I'm a new granddad. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> well, with those... With those uh, children in mind and with kids across the country in mind, um, I want to conclude our chat here, which has just flown by, by the way, uh, with a question that I hope uh, you can speak to directly to those folks. And so the LBJ School is in the arena full of students and alumni and faculty and staff who are working day in and day out to honor President Johnson's legacy by thinking outside the box to build programs and push policies and serve the public. And it's no secret that you and your brothers are remarkable public servants across sectors from media to academia to city government to the White House. Um, and in fact, uh, a quick plug for your memoir, Brothers Emmanuel, which I thought was wonderful, um, an extraordinary tale of your family's history and extraordinary parents, extraordinary impact on our country. Uh, I you. want to end, uh, Zeke, with a question. Um, what is your best advice for America's young people who look up to you and want to make our country better? So maybe I can take the prerogative of answering uh, in true political fashion and answer a different question first and then come back to the one you really did ask. You're the boss. You are a pediatrician and you know the person we're talking about, Lyndon Johnson, cared deeply about children and he understood the importance of investing in future generations. So if I had to say, you know, what's the single biggest investment government can do uh, for the future and for children, um, uh, it seems to me that uh, there's a program called the Nurse Family Partnership. It's early interventions with children, especially children at risk, children born into poverty or children in other deprived circumstances. You know, if we send a nurse or someone who can really work with the parent, educate them about how to be a parent, educate them about the development of children, the nutrition of children, uh, the stimulation of children in terms of reading them books, not giving them screen time. That investment pays huge dividends. It's not a government spending program. It turns out, and I use the word investment for a real reason, it actually t gives returns. It reduces Medicaid spending in the future. It reduces special education spending in the future. It reduces criminal justice in the future. And it increases the earnings of those children decades later, which increases taxes. Um, as a matter of fact, it's a program that begins to pay back in five years. You know, I think if Lyndon Johnson were alive today, that would be his number one goal because it takes a little government spending and then it generates returns. And the, it really is a true investment in children and in the future of this country. Um, and so I think that would be my number one agenda item uh, uh, to think about. Amen. Um, you know, I think if I were giving advice, of, which I give to, to my uh, children uh, all the time and frankly to my students all the time, you know, I think the most important thing is we're on this earth for a very short period of time. Um, we came here, uh, the uh, earth, the institutions of American democracy are here. We benefit from them. Uh, we don't all benefit equally, unfortunately, but we do benefit uh, through the structures. Uh, you know, we have relatively high incomes. The de deprivations of the past are no longer here. Um, uh, we have opportunities for education, opportunities for higher education. You know, you have to ask yourself, uh, and I think this is something our parents instilled in the Emanuel brothers, which is, how do I give back? What can I do to make this country better so that the future generations uh, have it uh, better than I've had it? And I think that's something that, you know, a lot of the grandparents or great-grandparents of the people who are watching this 
You know, they came to this country. They're, they were immigrants um, looking to make sure that their children and grandchildren had it better. And I think all of us have that responsibility. How can I make this country better for the future? And Lyndon Johnson, you know, that, that was what drove him. I know that there's a famous story early on in his actual presidency. You know, he came down, um, all his aides were working. I think it was on either the State of the Union or some speech. And they were like, well, we can't deal with the race. We can't deal with that issue. Um, it would be too uh, combustible, too divisive in the country. And he walks down and he says, well, we're going to start this with race. And why did he say that? You know, they were like shocked. You can't do it. And, and he said, we've got the power. What else are we going to do with the power? We've got to do good in this country uh, with the power we get. And I think, you know, that is something that has always stuck with me. We've got privileges when we get into positions where we can make something good for other people. That's our responsibility. It may be controversial, but that's the thing we have to dedicate ourselves to. And for all those alumni and students at the LBJ school, I would say that's what he did. And that's the message we should take forward to guide our, our lives. To do good in this country with the power we get. I can't think of a better way to end this. Thank you so much, Zeke, for sharing your time, for the incredible impact you have on Americans across the country. And thanks to each of you who have joined in helping us celebrate five decades in the arena at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure uh, and I wish well to all the students and alumni.